Welcome to Exphys Biz with me, Aaron King, a podcast for exercise physiologists and health professionals wanting to grow and scale in business. This time last year, I reviewed the trends of business for 22 to 23, and I'm doing that again for 2023 and into 2024. So I'll review what I spoke about and whether I was right or wrong. Um, we'll see. And what I think the trends might be uh, moving forward, because there are definitely some changes in the market over the last 12 months that we need to consider, both in the fitness area and also the allied health area, because as an EP, we might be looking at both of those areas, which have an impact on our business model. So looking back uh, about 12 months ago, uh, I did mention that third-party schemes are risky to base your entire business model on. That is still true, although it is actually a little bit better. I've changed my tune somewhat over the last six months specifically because as inflation has increased and as and the cost of living has just gone up for uh, everybody, <clears throat> our clients have also been affected. So previously I've said, and I've said this over the last 10 years almost, um, is that Relying on a third-party scheme is risky because anything can change at any time, like with work cover, with DVA, with Medicare. They'll change the rules, uh, cut the amount of support they provide, what they might pay for, how much they pay for it, or also freeze the Medicare costs for 10 years, And meaning that providers, medical providers and allied health providers just need to start charging a gap, all, the, all of these types of things. Um, so when you're relying on a third party model that you don't control yourself, then you're at the whims of you know, the market and you don't want to necessarily rely on that. And my view is always, look, you should build a really solid client base based on private uh, clients that are choosing to pay their own money to see you because you're not really at the whims of the market in that sense where somebody else is controlling it, you essentially do have some level of control over your marketing, over the types of clients you see. Um, and that's going to be better. It's still going to be better to rely on private clients, although it is probably currently one of the most challenging periods in recent times to gain private clients uh, because most people are affected by the cost of living and even if you share the view that I do, that your health should be right at the top of the priority uh, list, you know, extra services or you know, being seen as an extra service, whether it be their own uh, fitness and health, it's not the main priority for many people because obviously, you know, looking at the uh, hierarchy of needs, well, you want to be sheltered and fed and that's fair enough. Um, but you also want to be healthy while doing that. Um you know, but then people are choosing to spend money or not choosing to spend money because they have no choice. Um, they're just diverting their funds to other things. So it, you know, you may need to consider, okay, do I need to spend a little bit more focus and a little bit more time on the third party model? So where I've said, you know, at the moment, um, or in the last year, we were about 60% private and 40% third party. So again, we didn't have all our eggs in one basket, but now it's currently shifted to around 50-50. And it's something that I noticed with, you know, we had a little bit of a drop off with some of the private clients um, because of the cost of living pressures and inflation and things like that, where I diverted some of the attention to you know, network with third party providers and gain some additional clients that way, people that were still seeking out our service that maybe didn't know about us. So the important part is that you know, choosing to be funded by another scheme or not choosing, like if they're a work cover client or Medicare, maybe they didn't choose it. It's just the position that they found themselves in. So if they are going down that path, they may not be at the whims and they, their funding may not be uh, relevant to market changes like cost of living and inflation because it is a separate pool of money, pool of funding that is funding their service. So it might be something to consider is, you know, should I shift slightly and where are my clients coming from? Where should I see my clients? What types of clients can I see? Is it something that I enjoy, something that I'm focusing on and something that I am best at? And it might be shifting some focus, especially if you're a 
a private practice where you do have some ability to shift and you do tend to see you know, a lot of general clients from various programs, you tend to be a jack of all trades of sorts because in any one day, you might see multiple third-party clients and multiple private clients for many different reasons, both as individuals and as groups. Um, so we've shifted a little bit of our focus, both deliberately, but initially it wasn't even deliberate. It just tended to be that way. But as I always do, I review at the end of each week, each month, each quarter of what's actually happening so I can keep on top of things. The benefit of being a small business, I guess, and a small team, in essence, there is no red tape because we just make a decision and roll with it and it can happen overnight Um, because I just make the decision and we implement it, check to see if it works. If it does, keep going with it. If it doesn't, then change direction. Um, So you can make your own third you don't make your own third party um but you consider what types of third party clients you are best off seeing and you are best of uh, working with and how what kind of support you can provide them so that they get the outcomes they want working towards their goals but you're also not um you know not at the whims of the the market and finding the best fit for you so i still think you know, looking at the trends in the past it was more private less third party, but now it's probably shifted to maybe be about 50-50. So focusing on any one model where all your eggs in one basket is probably a bit of a risky strategy because again, if you had all private clients, then you're at the risk of the market changes there. But in the past, if you've had all third party clients, whether it be one specific model of third party, whether it be work cover, DVA, Medicare, NDIS, or other schemes, you're at the whim of whatever market changes happen there so again don't put all your eggs in one basket uh consider what niches you are best off seeing but as well you can still see a couple of niches because you might have a top two or three or if you have some staff you might have a specific niche that you're really good at but some of your other team might have their own niches that you can really work um depending upon your skills and experience so moving on from there I looked at last year, the groups, and I said, you know, it's not really a trend in EP, but it will be. And I think that has come along. So I think I was uh, correct there that um, group programming from EPs is still coming along and it needs to get tailored to the market. But there are some pros and cons. Like I found that in the past, there was only really major gym chains that were running sort of large group classes. And they were probably considered classes because they're that larger, you know, 20, 30 size, not the four, eight or 10 kind of size that you might uh, find might be better suited to EP type uh, businesses. So there are some things that changed in the market recently, which may have an effect on EPs and on PT. And I say that interchangeably because EPs can work as PTs or in the market, we're seen as PTs with additional experiences. And that's not to discredit EPs at all. Because uh, at the end of the day, we just need we just get called what the market knows us as. So they're like, oh, they're that rehab EP, rehab PT. Ideally, if you don't see them, if you say, look, I'm not a PT, I'm an EP, many clients might say, oh, look, that's not who I'm looking for. I'm looking for a PT with experience in this rehab or this clinical need. They're actually looking for an EP, but they just don't know what an EP is called. And you can't blame them because we're still getting out in the market uh, in that sense. So with the many different fitness programs, whether it be like functional fitness, uh, you know, that got kind of really saturated in the market. And then it's, I guess, trimming the leaves, so to speak. And the ones that will remain are the high quality services that provide more of a community uh, and more support and are really focused on their local community. The ones that maybe just jumped on the bandwagon with a big brand and didn't really run it and didn't really care that much, then they'll sort of be uh, be trimmed. But the benefit of those larger programs that were more, you know, medium to higher priced, I guess you would call it, because you've got the, you know, $20 a week gyms, which are all access, no service commercial models, 24 hour. But then you've got the ones that might be, you know, 50, 60, 70, $80 a week, um, or whatever it may be, it might be slightly higher, might be slightly lower, depending upon your service offerings. But people that have come from those other mid to high tier offerings coming over to an EP run group fitness, 
they're less likely to balk at the price. And that's what I found. People come from those other programs, which we're, we're sort of similar priced, even though in my view, we offer a, we, I say Fit Clinic, um, we offer a higher value service because we maybe focus on, you know, having six, eight, 10 or 12 at a maximum in our groups. And we focus on being able to provide one-to-one service and support within that whole group and being able to modify and tailor based on our skills and experience and have people that have clinical needs as well as general needs all in the one session. But overall, those functional fitness models have been really beneficial to the market because it's just shown the market that there are other offerings out there, not just the 24-7 all access, no service model. So even if you don't agree with certain approaches in business to some like studio providers or some studio type brands or other fitness brands, it's still been a benefit to the industry. And people have said to me, look, you know, you must not like X brand or that brand. At the end of the day, I don't really care. There's enough for everybody. Um, but at the end of the day, it's provided a benefit to the b- benefit to the whole industry because it's just showing people that there are more out there. So we've had people come to us because they've just seen other brands and they know that it's out there. So then they found us by that, even if they were, they were looking for us, but they didn't know that we existed because they didn't know that there were other types of services out there. <clears throat> so while I think the functional fitness craze will sort of settle, same thing happened with CrossFit many years ago. Many facilities came out of the woodwork and really ramped up and there was one on every corner. And then after a while, the sort of fad died down and there are still many great facilities out there, but it sort of trimmed the ones that maybe weren't running and were just uh, going running on the back of the brand doing the work and they weren't actually being great at a standalone facility. But just like all the functional fitness brands that would be great as a standalone facility, then they would probably still continue whether they continue as the brand they started at or they sort of rebrand based on whatever happens uh, in the market whether those major brands are actually there and they're still franchising or whether some of them go go under I guess we don't know with some of the big brands in the market that are not doing well on the the stock market I guess Um, so I still think that last year I said that group programming is going to grow and I still think it's continuing to grow even if it looks like a couple of specific brands in the markets are not growing and they're going backwards, that's true. But I also think as a whole that people will just be able to find other services out there. And that's where you might come in as an EP to find your niche group programming, whether that's a clinical group or whether that's a non-clinical group or whether it's mixed. Last year, again, I spoke about telehealth and online. It's more acceptable. And we personally run a hybrid model where we can coach our clients online as well as face-to-face. We have online-only clients that are global. And I actually got global clients off the back of some dumb viral reels that happen on Instagram. And um, that's how we grew our uh, our followers, I guess you would say. Um, And having a larger... Yeah, a larger base of followers on Instagram is not doesn't mean shit at the end of the day. Um, but if you then provide an offer or you provide a link in your bio or something like that, and only 1% of your community is interested or 1% of your followers are interested, well, 1% of a bigger audience is still going to be higher. So you might get half a dozen by that. And we've found that to be true for us. Um, but we still have a you know, geographic model where we're based in Southwest Sydney and we have people come from, you know, 10, 15 K radius around to see us. And that's more of the geographic model because to come to a specific facility, people don't tend to travel too far unless you're a specific niche service uh, that you're going in intermittently for a specific reason. Maybe you're an elite athlete and you need to see a specific person for a specific reason. Um, But, you know, us general people, people generally come from a geographic location and, but then we also have the hybrid model, which is happened out of COVID or born out of COVID, I guess, um, where we saw people online, but then the people that came back face-to-face following that, we see them in a hybrid model where we still support them online with all their data, all their programs, all their um, education online. So they can contact us both online and offline. Um, yeah, but moving forward, social media is going to continue to grow. There's probably going to be Know, different ways and approaches, but I think again it might be too saturated and it's too difficult to 
grow massively online and get a large database, you still need an Instagram. You probably still need a website at the moment, um, more so for legitimacy rather than um, using it as anything in particular. I don't think you need a website, but I say have one for legitimacy because people look you up. And if you have a website related to a physical location, then it shows people that you're a real life person and it's possible to go to see. Um, so you could even do that with Facebook, Instagram, just having a profile. It doesn't have to be large. Like we see the same amount of people face to face when we had a thousand followers versus when now, when we have over 30,000 on our main page, we still see the same amount of people face to face. It's the online portion that grew from the Instagram following, not necessarily the face to face model. Um, so I still think having a community culture networking and going out and you know, face-to-face -face and sort of doing the work is really important. And don't forget that. So don't forget the things that work and try to go online. So the trend is to go online and try to sell something online. But there's so many people in the market. Don't forget to be face-to-face -face and speak to people because people buy from others that they know, like, and trust. It's important to have a profile because people will maybe trust you well before they see you because of things that you say, do, and how you maybe act online. At the moment, there are more jobs than people in the EP market. So you can, you know, you still have options uh, out there. So finding something that suits and making sure that you're, um, you're looked after and you're cared for. But again, if I'm moving into 2024, I've discussed some of the things that did happen and some things that I think are going to happen and where the market's at. But again, for 2024, I think at the moment in the interim, you know, we're seeing 60% private um, in 2023, but that sort of shifted towards the end now that it's like 50-50. So consider what other models that you need to integrate into your um, business and consider whether you know marketing your third-party options is is best for you at the moment, at least in the short term, until interest rates sort of settle, which might not happen for over 12 months, maybe two years. We don't know. 24 fitness is 24 hour fitness is still going to play a role. It's still a an option. But I think in the market there are many 24 hour fitness models. There are really big players and they're probably monopolizing the market. Um and maybe some of the smaller providers are not going to stay in the market um, uh, moving moving forward. But consider your niche for smaller providers. If you're a smaller provider, smaller business, smaller EP practice, then having a niche, because like we only need to see 100 people a, a week, I was about to say a day, um, 100 people a week, rather than needing to get in 3,000 people a week. So you can see a smaller amount by seeing less people more often, uh, not more often, sorry, um, less people with more value and providing them with what they need because people will come to see you for you, not just how much you charge. Because obviously if people focus just on price, then they would say they would go to a 24 seven gym, but people maybe go to a 24 seven gym and that really works for a lot of people. Others they'll go there and they won't get the value out of paying 15 or $20 a week, but they'll get the value out of paying 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, a hundred or more per week because of the, support that they're getting so consider what niche you're doing whether it's individual or groups again telehealth and online more acceptable so consider adding that to that and don't forget your community culture networking because if you're providing higher value you can create your own niche and offer your services at higher prices not just for the sake of offering them at higher prices because that's really where you're going your value is going to be and that's probably where it truly sits because at the end of the day, as health professionals, we tend to undervalue our own service um, because we get into it because we care about people and we want to help people. But at the end of the day, we also need to help people while still keeping the doors open because then we can help more people because my money isn't the goal, but it just provides opportunities to then help more people if we um, can provide money to grow our service, grow ourselves, educate ourselves, educate our team and support all those around us. And if you get to a point and go, look, I don't need all this money, then you can work with charities, you can do pro bono things. But to be able to do that, you need to have enough security to be able to do that first. So it's not the goal, but it certainly helps. Because at the end of the day, only 8 to 10% of businesses in EP 
are earning over 150k or more a year, which isn't much when you uh, pay for your overheads. Um, so there's really only a small percentage of EP businesses that are earning enough to be a fully fledged company going beyond uh, the sort of self-employed uh, model. You know, and costs have only risen anywhere between 10 to 25 percent for businesses in the last 12 months alone. But prices around the market haven't risen that much. So we need to find a way to support clients and give value while still earning a living for ourselves. So I think consider the the trends moving forward, whether third party or private is for you or what kind of mix there is. Consider what kind of groups you want, because I think that's important to have some form of group, because if you're only seeing one-on-one -on -one person, then you're obviously relying on changes, reschedules, cancelings. But if you're seeing groups, then you're providing a bit more security to yourself and also to other people because other people still like community. Don't forget being face-to-face -face and interacting with people and networking with people in 2024 and try to do things just online because at the end of the day, people still want to deal with people and there might be a bit of an overkill with just doing everything online. Sure, it's great. But it's also important to interact with people face to face. And when I say face to face, that could even be if your model's online, then at least, you know, jump on a call, jump on a Zoom or whatever other teams or whatever else you got going on. Um, you know, jump on a call and speak to someone face to face, even if you're not in the same room. Um and if you have any questions with any of this, then you can reach out and I'm happy to answer them. You've just listened to another episode of XFiz Biz. If you've got some value out of the content, make sure that you like, share, follow, or subscribe. Until next time.